Um, now, we have got um, something like a quarter of an hour for participation from the other delegates. So if you want to say something, um, just indicate. But can I just ask you, if it's going to be a question, please make it a question with a question mark at the end of it so that the panelists can answer. If you want to make a comment, keep it short. Keep it um, you know, under a minute if you can. So anybody like to participate? Yes, hi, hi, this is a question for Gita. Um, in many cultures, I have found that often women are their worst enemies, and they seem to be the ones that actually encourage the continuation of, of nefarious traditions, really. And I wanted, uh, since you have direct experience of that, I wanted for you to comment on how many we, uh, Muslim women actually are coerced into Sharia courts, or how many of them are, you know, quietly or comfortably compliant? I can't say, um, I can't quantify how many, but my experience shows that actually um, what we're talking about is the most vulnerable women in, our, in communities where they have very little access to the outside world. One of the first things that women need is access to state services so that they can be informed of their rights, so that they can have awareness of their rights, so that they can then choose how to assert those rights. The problem is that as we see the rise and rise of religious identity, and the stranglehold, the, the way in which religious power is wielded in communities, those spaces that have existed, those secular spaces, secular women's centers, um, like mine, for example, uh, shelters for abused women and so on, even, even law centers, those spaces have been shut down because of the economic situation, partly, and also because uh, they are delegitimized by the religious power. So what we're seeing is actually when, when a lot of people say, well, women voluntarily are going to these religious forums, I think we have to question whether they're really exercising agency, what they're seek they may be seeking to do. They, they may be going there, but they're forced there often, either because all the other state structures are, are, um, are difficult to access, either because they're closed down or um, because of other reasons, social and cultural reasons, or because within the community itself, uh, there's a considerable stigma attached to seeking state support. You're seen to betray, or you're seen to be a traitor, or you're, or you're, you're sinning against your religious identity. So women are being compelled to use religious forums for all sorts of reasons, but the emphasis is on the fact that they're compelled. The studies that we've done show that they actually do not trust religious authority. The majority of them know instinctively that they will not get their rights. And they know that they have a battle with state services, including the legal system, but they still place their hope and faith in the wider legal system, however imperfect it is, in terms of getting their rights. And so, really, it's a question of the kind of social compulsion and pressures that exist, including the economic situation that exists, that's forcing women um, down that road. Yeah. I like, as a coordinator of International Campaign Against Sharia Accord, I like to just give one tiny example. I work for the shelter as well. Women, they, they hired a hijabist. Uh, the, as a shelter worker, women who would come to the shelter and they so-called Muslim, they would not go to hijabis. They prefer to come to us and ask the right from us. In fact, those shelter workers would never face any uh, person who, are, who is forced from these so-called communities, Islamic communities, to give them guidelines about their rights by law of the country. They come to us and they request us to, to give them the guide. So that shows that they are really forced to go and follow their leaders of so-called, um, you know, community leaders of Muslims or whatever. Thank you. Uh, hearing the panelists today, 
makes me very grateful for the organisers of this conference because what it's reminding me is of fiction with Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's, ta Handmaid's Tale. That was fiction, but what we're hearing about in Poland, what's happening in the UK, and what can so easily happen in other countries too, is that all the things that we thought were laid down in law, all the freedoms, all the secular freedoms, can actually be rolled back, and it shows the importance of ever constant vigilance. Uh, yeah, some, some fascinating talks here, and uh, I think it's probably a question for you, Terry. Um, it, how many secular states are there in the world today, and has that number gone up or down in the last decade? Well, I, I can't give you a definitive answer to that. I think there are several countries that have secular constitutions but are by no means secular in practice. Um, I think the famous ones like France and America... Um, and Japan, uh, th th these are countries that have, have made secularism work to an extent. But as one of the speakers earlier said, secularism is not a cure-all. Um, it, it can't solve every problem. It cannot stop sectarian violence. It, it can stop the state participating in sectarian violence, but it can't stop religious people hating each other and fighting and killing each other. So um, secularism has its limits, I think. Um, how many secular states, truly secular states, there are in, in the world, you can probably count on one hand. Um, I would like to say, um, in reference uh, with what I was talking about, uh, I would like to give uh, an example of Sweden because it seems to me the only country for the moment uh, that obtained uh, the secularism um, which is already fixed, in, which is already declared in the constitution. So it is a secular state by constitution and on the same time uh, the society of Sweden, people from of Sweden are in the very high rank secular, even in the sense that they left religion. So I think it is the only example I know that uh, the both um, models uh, are joined by laws and by secularization. Uh, I think uh, this is a, shall I say, tricky question? Uh, I don't know if it's the quite the, the good word. But as, um, so as a citizen from Senegal, which is a secular, uh, an état laïc, no, an état laïc, I think it is very important that uh, my état laïc give me some right that I cannot have in Saudi Arabia. I am Muslim, in Saudi Arabia they are Muslim, but really the difference is, uh, is, is very big. And even in France, when I've lived for 10 years and go back and forth, um, I think it is even, uh, France is a république laïque, and the French know they are laïque, and even if Muslim communities and uh, Muslim, uh, I don't like the word Muslim communities, but some communities say, okay, we need to have our specific law, we need some uh, accommodement raisonnable. I think there is a strict difference. And uh, my last case is in Mali. North, the northern, in the northern part of Mali, when uh, all the jihadist group coming from, uh, let's say, north part of Africa, west part of Africa, and take that other word, uh, being uh, an Islamic uh, country, with a Sharia law, uh, ends were cut for stealing. Uh, women were stoned for adultery, and that didn't happen in Bamako. So for me, uh, people can be more a little bit more laic, less laic, but there is a clear distinction between a state being like. It's very easy when you live in other parts of the world where. Uh, laicity, laicity is something inclusive that people know the principle about. Uh, it's, 
And uh, but it's a clear in my mind. It's a very, very it's a crystal clear that what laicity is all about, and what non laic is also all about. I suppose we ought to declare an interest. Uh, I'm uh, Terry Sanderson's uh, executive director of the National Zakir Society. Um, but just actually picking up on the on the Sharia point, I really want to pay uh, credit to uh, Pragna's wonderful work. But it's not just in the UK. We, 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 I've just been looking at Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, Germany. It's spreading and it's going all in the wrong direction. Uh, and we really need to take a grip on this. And I've, I've really worked hard on trying to think how we can be most effective on this strategically. Uh, and I've brought it up three times now at the European Commission. Um, including at presidential level. Um, and I think we're starting to get somewhere. And I think the biggest lever that we've got is not through the justice side, but through women's rights. So can you all think about how you can bring these issues up to your legislative people, to your members of parliament, uh, on a feminist basis of the unfairness against women? And we really must have a concerted effort on that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I would like to say something. If law does not protect women's right and children's right or human right, if law takes one side or doesn't talk and take silence, if there is no law to protect us, enforce law, I'm talking about not only written law as, as let's say, Arbitration Act 1989, I want enforcement of law. So if anyone takes away any justice from any woman, I want that person to be persecuted and take into court and faces consequences. If the law is not enforced, doesn't matter how much women's rights movement try to push for a better life, it's impossible. So I do agree that the women's movement, equality rights movement, let's say equality rights movement is the, the movement for equality between men and women, or children's rights movement. If they push the government to enforce a law or have a law or, or make the law in such a way that would protect me and you and everyone else in the society then and enforce it, then for sure it's very important the streets to come up and, and all our forces to join together and make a better world. But without making that, that better world as a law of the government, it's impossible. To me, we have to make secularism as a law of the government. And not only that, we have to enforce it. We have to have police to chase it. We have to have courts to persecute the ones who are disobeying the law of secularism. That's the main issue from us as the defender of human rights and children's rights. Thank you. I need to add a, a remark. In 92, there was a huge citizens' movement led by women's organizations, by feminists, uh, that collected one million and a half of signatures uh, claiming the referendum on uh, abortion issue because it was already the project to ban uh, abortion in Poland. And this huge initiative was simply neglected, even not, not uh, ported to the uh, parliament. So yes, if we don't have a law that respect women's rights, it is really uh, difficult. And I have to say that the uh, European Union um, is uh, accepting this fact. It is not, uh, nothing is done. Um, women in Poland lost their rights. We are in the European Union. We, uh, half democracy is not democracy at all, and nothing, nothing happens. Okay, um, we are running behind time, so that's going to have to be it. But I want to thank our panel. They've been very 
inspiring. And um, also uh, semi-disciplined about the timings. And um, uh, now we're going to have, I think, uh, a celebrity guest. So uh, we'll wind up now. And thank you very much for your participation too.